It is good to see each of you in the class this evening. We are <clears throat> on lesson number 22 in our study of uh, the New Testament church. Uh, it is unbelievable how close we are to summer series. Doesn't seem like it ought to be that time of the year yet, but a couple of more weeks <clears throat> and then we'll be there. I believe we have what will prove to be an exciting and interesting study in our summer series. We're going to be looking at the word better in the book of Hebrews. So it'll be somewhat of a study of Hebrews, but uh, more specifically those areas where by inspiration the writer talked about better things, better covenant, better sacrifice, so forth. And so you might want to be reading ahead a little bit and finding those passages and looking at the context in which they're found. And then you'll be somewhat prepared for uh, the lesson studies that we'll have from week to week in that regard. <clears throat> we do usually, I think we do, usually put that list in the bulletin ahead of time uh, so you'll know who's coming and what their topic is to be. And that way you can do some preparation yourself to, to be a little bit aware of what they're going to be talking about. So, so that is almost upon us. Uh, tonight we're going to look at Lesson 22, which continually dealing with uh, uh, the organization to some degree of the church as we look at the duties, responsibilities of members toward the elders. <clears throat> then we'll have a couple of weeks where we will introduce some things on worship. The next several lessons after tonight, uh, I think there are about eight or ten lessons in a row that will deal specifically with the worship of the New Testament church. And that will certainly, I think, show some <clears throat> difference between what the Bible speaks of as worship and what the religious world in general is willing to accept as worship. And so we'll, we'll get to that Lord willing, in our beginning of that study next week. But if you look at the outline, you'll note that we begin this particular lesson with a review of the duties of elders toward the members. And we did an entire lesson in that regard. And it is important that the elders understand the responsibilities that they have when they accept that good work. Remember that Paul said in writing to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, the man desire the office of an elder, he desireth a what? Good work. <clears throat> so what is the responsibility involved in that? So you can read back over that list. It's just by way of review. But then I noted that it is always easier to think about what somebody else owes us what somebody else's responsibility toward us is more than it is for us to think about our responsibility toward others. And yet that's the very basis of this study this evening is our responsibility to them, our responsibility to the elders. One of the passages that we'll note shortly uses the expression relative to those men as being over you. And the idea of their being over us in the Lord simply suggests that they are, in essence, our spiritual leaders, our leaders in spiritual things, not in worldly matters. So long as what we do of a secular nature does not affect our relationship with God, then really the elders have no business going there. Now, if it affects our relationship with God, such things as our either occasional or daily activities or our occupation or other things that may have some bearing on our spirituality, then yes, they have a responsibility there. But generally speaking, their responsibility is over our spiritual affairs to help guide us, direct us, encourage us, to do that which is right in the eyes of God. And as we noted when we talked about that lesson, they're not lawmakers. 
If you want to think of it in terms of law, they're basically law enforcers to see that we live our lives in harmony with the law of Christ. And then where that's not taking place, encourage us, admonish us, rebuke us, whatever the case might be, to help get us back in the way that we need to be going. And so the Holy Spirit has given not only the qualifications of those men, but He has given them the responsibility to rule over. But at the same time, the Holy Spirit gives the church the responsibility to submit to. And so there is a mutual responsibility. I'm afraid that in far too many cases through the years, we have really emphasized their responsibility to us, but we don't seem to want to talk quite so much about our responsibility to them. And yet it is much a part of the will of God as the former. We need to know what our responsibility is, and then we can carry it out. We can glorify God in that regard. We must always have agreement, understanding between elders and, and congregations in order for the Lord's church to succeed as God intends for it to succeed. And so by knowing, by them knowing what their responsibility is and we knowing what our responsibility is and both carrying out that responsibility, the end result ought to be peace. And that's one of the things uh, that is noted within the context uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 when he concludes that section by saying, Be at peace among yourselves. When elders are doing the work that God has given them to do and fulfilling their responsibility to the church that God has given them. And then the church is responding to the elders the way that God has instructed us to. Then the end result will be peace. Now to what extent the elders choose not to do their work and fulfill their responsibilities or to whatever extent we as members of the body of Christ who are to submit to them choose not to do that, then we can disrupt the peace that God intends for us to have. There's one thing that God's people ought to really strive for, it's peace among ourselves. Now we're not to be at peace with the world. And Jesus talked about uh, that He didn't come to bring peace but a sword, and some have tried to misuse that. He wasn't talking about among His own people. God's people are to be at peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are to be called children of God. Seek peace and ensue it. Follow things that make for peace. And on and on and on the passages go that instruct us as God's people to be at peace. We ought to strive for that as much as we strive for anything. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 3. And so that's what we're striving for and in fulfilling our responsibility then that can happen and there can be a very pleasant, a very peaceful, a very profitable work within the congregation between those who are overseeing and those who are following. But if it's going to work, that is their response to us, our response to them, we must be willing to be fed. We must be willing to be overseen. We must be willing to be led in the paths of righteousness. And any rebellion on our part to that end is going to be, number one, in violation of the will of God, and number two, going to create problems within the local congregation. We don't want that. We want that peace. So we've listed a number of things here, and, and again, this is one of those uh, lessons where uh, we probably won't cover nearly all of it, but but you should have the outlines and can study some on your own, but we at least want to hit the high spots of it in our study tonight. First thing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 
And in verse 12, Paul writes, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Now, we'll look more at this as we go. But the idea is to know the elders. Does that not mean more than just know who they are? Have you ever been to a congregation visiting and asked some member of the church, well, who are your elders here in this congregation? To hear the response, well, you know, I'm not really sure. I know who one or two of them is, but I'm not really sure who all the elders are here now. There is a member of the Lord's church that is way shy of the command of God to know your elders. You've got to know who they are before you can know them. The idea of knowing here in this, in this particular section is to acknowledge, to respect, to duly regard those men because of the work that they are doing, to know them fully, to get to know them. Well, how do we do that? How do we get to know elders? Yeah, be a part of the Brothers Keeper program. That's that'd be a good place to start. There's no way to get to know them by just coming and going at this church building. There's no way. We can know who they are. We can speak to them as we come and go. But if you're going to really get to know someone, you're going to have to spend time with them. That takes some effort on our part, doesn't it? To get to know. Know who they are, but know something about them. Because you see, one of the things that we're going to note later on is that we are to follow them. Well, if you don't know them, you don't know where they're headed. And you can't very successfully follow somebody that you don't know. One of the things interesting about Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, he said, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. But more than once in that letter to the church at Corinth, he made statements or, or wrote expressions that basically said to those folks, You know me. How did they know him? He had spent time there with them. He was responsible for the conversion of many of them. They knew him. And so when he said to them, you follow me, they, they knew where Paul was headed. They knew the life that he was living. They knew something about him. And so we have that responsibility. So we need to get to know them, know something about them, know what they stand for, know who they are as far as their Christian life is concerned. Then he says in the very next verse, and to esteem them, 1 Thessalonians 5, 13, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And there's the expression, be at peace among yourselves. So esteem. There are several passages, and we've noted some in the outline where that word esteem is used in other places. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, let each esteem other. There's a responsibility that we have as brethren to esteem one another as brethren. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse, uh, actually verses 24 through 28, is the Hebrews writer account of Moses' life. And you'll recall that he chose to do what? Suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. And then what does the next verse say? We're familiar with that. But then what does the next verse say? Esteeming the reproach of Christ. What's he talking about? He was choosing not the riches of this world, and he had opportunity to have the riches of this world, didn't he? Where was he reared? In the house of Pharaoh. I mean, he had every opportunity to be basically overseer of Egypt. But he chose not to do that. He chose not to do it. 
He esteemed something more. He had respect under the recompense of reward. So you study that context with regard to Moses. And then, of course, uh, this, this particular verse right here. So the idea of esteeming. Consider them, know their instruction, honor their leadership, love and respect them. One of the things that we've noted here in the outline, I think, is of utmost importance for us. The Bible deals little with mere sentiment of emotion. Now by, that, by that I simply mean if we respect someone is it going to be evident by our conduct or do, or, or do we just have to tell everybody well, I, I esteem my elders, I, I respect my elders. You don't, have to, you don't have to tell anybody you respect your elders. They'll know it by your life. If we say that we love the brethren, do we have to go around saying that? Well, there's nothing wrong with saying. Nothing wrong with telling people you love them. But suppose that's the only way they know that you love them. It won't work, will it? It will be shown. So that's what I mean by the idea here of, of the Bible dealing little with just mere sentiment of emotion. The Bible encourages, encourages us to be active in these areas. If we respect our elders, let them know by our conduct that we respect them. If we esteem them, let them know that we esteem them for their work's sake. That's the idea. And it shows itself in deeds of kindness and helpfulness and whatever the need is. I wonder what it would mean to elders to be overseeing a congregation where every member within the congregation was almost just standing in the face of the elders as if to say, what do you want me to do now? Well, what can I do now? What do you need me to do now? I wonder how the elders would enjoy that kind of work. Is that a congregation of people like that? They probably faint, yeah. They wonder what do you want, what do you want, you know? But that's the idea involved here of, of esteeming them. Let them know it. We'll aid them in their work. Esteem them highly. Literally here, exceedingly high. So it's not just, yeah, they're all right. Yeah, they're an okay bunch of guys, I guess. No, that's not the idea here. Esteem them highly. In love, well, if they're brethren, we ought to love them, oughtn't we? We ought to love one another in honor. We ought to prefer one another. We're to love one another. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that my disciples, if you have love one for another. So, I mean, that concept is taught over and over and over. But our response to them is a response of love, not a response of duty. You know, one of the things that um, Eric Owens, one of the speakers at the youth rally last Saturday, emphasized in, in his both, both of his studies to some degree. But the point that he, that he kept emphasizing was that, that as a saved people, we are servants of God out of respect for the fact that we are saved. And the, the contrast that he was trying to make is we don't take every step that we take every day seeking God's approval. We're saved people. And our life should reflect that in a life of appreciation for the fact that, that the blood of Christ has cleansed us from our sins. And so in the same regard here, we respect and show that respect not because it's our duty, but because we love those men for the work that they're doing. And that's what he says, for their work's sake, for their labor, for their toil that they put in for the church. We just looked at three or four ideas involved here. They're willing to take my soul into their care as an individual. That's pretty good responsibility, isn't it? They watch for my soul, and that's something that we'll talk about a little bit later. They're willing to take the church 
into their care collectively. Not only do they look out for my soul as an individual, but, but collectively, collectively they look out for us. The hours of prayer in which they engage for wayward members, heartbreaking sessions to preserve families and marriages, the hours of talking with lost souls, wayward members, trying to get them to do what's right, hours of planning to help the church be most effective. And so we honor them for their work's sake. So how do we honor them? We can honor them by honoring the work that they assign us to do. If they ask us to do something, we agree to do it. They ought not to have to ask twice. They ought not to have to come back in a week or a month or whatever the time period might be relative to the specific task and say, well, have you finished that work yet? Have you started that work yet? But if we want to honor them when they give us an assignment, we'll get on with it. We won't be negligent in that regard. When they exhort us and when they admonish us, we'll heed that exhortation. We'll heed that admonition if we're honoring and respecting them. But I think we can show a great deal of honor and respect to our elders if we will defend them in unjustified attacks. Now, we know that it's so easy to make accusation against anybody, isn't it? On the next page, number five ties in with this so well. Let's just skip down to there at this point, and we'll back up as, as time permits. But number five, major point number five, receive not accusation against elders without witness. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19, against an elder, receive not an accusation but before two or three witnesses. Receive not an accusation. Now, I want you to notice something here. This command has to do with what? What does he say don't do here? All right. Receive an accusation. He's not addressing here making an accusation. That's a different story. Right here, he's dealing with people who are so ready and willing to accept any kind of accusation that comes their way regarding the elders. And folks, when we do that, we have sinned against God. And you think about that. He's not talking about making the accusation here. He's talking about receiving that accusation. Now, there are other passages and so forth that talk about, you know, making accusations and so forth. But receive not an accusation. Except how? Two or three witnesses. Somebody runs up to you and says, man, you know what, you know what I saw an elder do? You know what I heard about an elder the other day? Instead of saying, what? You ought to, be, you ought to say, how many witnesses do you have to what you're fixing to tell me? You think that might stop some of the receiving of accusation? If we'd just stop and say, now you, you do have two or three witnesses to what you're about to tell me, don't you? Because see, that's what God's Word teaches. This is not the only place, and it's not only relative to elders. And I don't, I'm not going to take the time tonight to, to go into all these passages, but this is a principle from God all down through the process of time, both Old and New Testament. You go back to the book of Deuteronomy. I put one passage in here, 17.6, Deuteronomy 19.15 as well, 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 1, John 8, verse 17, Matthew 18, verse 16. All of those passages, both Old and New Testament, tell us that accusations 
need to bear witnesses. But how often is that the case? You need to think about that, and I need to think about that. The next time somebody comes running to you or comes running to me with an accusation against anybody, in this particular case, elders, but it applies forever. So if somebody comes to you with an accusation against somebody, before you receive that accusation, you might want to ask, now, do you have witnesses to what you're about to tell me? And if they say, well, no, not really. I, as far as I know, I'm the only one who knows anything about it. Then the Bible forbids me to receive that accusation from you. Now, you think that won't stop gossip? It will. Is this a command of God? Yes, it is. And it's one that is sorely needed in the Lord's church tonight. Again, not just against elders, but, but we know how easy it is to make accusation against those who are willing to accept leadership responsibilities. Who is it that usually gets criticized? Preacher. People who are doing something. You know, it doesn't matter if it's me or the elders or deacons or you, whoever. The people that get criticized are the people who are doing something. Usually those who make the accusations and criticism are the people sitting back observing what's being done. You just watch that and see how closely that works. Not in every case, but, but for the most part. That's why we need to be busy in the Lord's work. We don't have time for a lot of gossip and accusation and receiving accusation and that kind of stuff. So the idea of receive here, as we are noting in point five, to receive or to admit with approval or to accept. Elders can and do make mistakes. But be careful not to receive every report that comes your way concerning them. Then back up to the top of the page there for just a moment. The matter of being in submission to and obeying the elders. Submit simply means to yield under, to give up, resist, carry the idea. We're retiring, withdrawing our objection before the authority of the elders. And the reason is we submit to them. Why? For they watch for our souls. Now that stresses the extreme importance of their work and the responsibility that anyone ex accepts who accepts that work. They're taking on the watching of the souls of every member of that congregation. Do you think that's an easy task? That's why they don't have time to mow the yard and unlock and lock the building and trim the hedges and paint the building and do everything else of a manual nature that Robert does. And sometimes he gets a little help. Gets it when he asks for it. They don't have time to do much of any of the physical work within the local church. They've got a load just watching for my soul and yours to make sure that, that they're keeping us where we need to be. And so we have the responsibility we, to, to submit to them, not just when we agree with their decisions. You know, um, this is not in your outline, but I want to cover this uh, before our time runs out. But there are at least five ways in which we as members of this congregation can respond to our elders. There are at least five ways. Number one, we can respond in agreement and submission. I agree with that. I, I think that's a great decision. I'm going to submit to it. That's one. A second possibility is non-agreement, but submission without causing trouble. I don't necessarily agree with that decision, but you know the Bible teaches me God expects me to submit, and that is exactly what I'm going to do. I don't know that the Bible calls upon us to agree with every single decision the elders make, but it does call upon us to submit to them, whether we agree or not. Now understand in this, this particular discussion, 
we're talking about areas that are obviously not in violation of the will of God. We do not agree with the elder one step of the way if he's in violation of the will of God. And you understand that. We're talking about other matters here. So agreement and submission, non-agreement but submission without causing trouble. A third way we can respond to the elders is indifference or just ignore. Well, they made the decision. I don't care. I don't have to do it. I can do it if I want to. Don't do it if I don't want to. Just, just ignore. Just pretend they don't exist. Number four, not agree with them and cause trouble about it. Or number five, don't agree with them, get puffed up, don't submit to them, and leave. Now those are the only five ways that I can think of that you can respond to the decision of elders. Now which of those five have any scriptural backing at all? One and two. One and two. Which one would obviously be the preference? One. <laughs> we would hope that we could agree with every decision that they make. But if we don't, we still need to submit. Anything less than that is going to be a violation of the will of God. So um, the idea of obey, Hebrews 13, 17, and that's the particular context here. Obey them to have the rule over you and submit yourself. To obey simply means to listen to, to yield to, to comply with. You know, we live in a, in a pretty selfish, rebellious, individual rights society. We don't want anybody messing with that. But remember, God's people are different, aren't they? They're different. They don't always let the society in which they live dictate the way they live their lives. But did you notice here there are five expressions in this one verse that point to their authority and our need to submit to them. Five expressions in one verse. Obey, submit, rule, watch, give account. All of those have their specific implications in that regard. And I've always tried to point out Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, the last phrase of that verse. He says, Obey them that have the rule over you. Submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy, not with grief. And then that last phrase, For that is unprofitable for me. If I don't submit, if I don't obey, if I don't esteem, if I don't respect, my elders. And as a result of that, it causes them grief. That's unprofitable for me, not them. Me. Puts a burden on me, doesn't it? I don't know here. Our elders haven't specifically addressed this issue with me. So I'm not saying anything that they've told me in this regard, so I'm not violating any confidence here. But I would suspect in most congregations, hopefully it's not the case here, but probably in most congregations, that there is one or two or three or four members who, when the elders see them coming, respond, oh no, wonder what now. What does that say about that individual? Their life is a grief to the elders. It's a grief to the elders just to see them coming. What does the writer say? That's unprofitable for that person. Not for the elders, but for that person. At the same time, hopefully there are those within this congregation who, when the elders see coming, can put a smile on their face, see this person as somebody who is 
ambitious, who is cooperative, who is dependable, who is always ready and willing to do whatever the elders ask them to do in the work of the Lord. That's the kind of people we need to try to be in response and respect to our elders in, in that regard. Then he mentions to imitate Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken to you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation and manner of life. I understand that in some commentators you will find that there are those who believe this verse here has specific reference to the apostles instead of the elders. I'm, I'm not one who subscribes to that idea. But because there are other, even if this verse didn't say it, there are other verses that teach the very same thing as we've already noted. But, but that's conditional. We've already noted 1 Corinthians 11, 1, where Paul said, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. We need to follow those men as they're following Christ. Follow their love, follow their faith, follow, follow their liberality, their attendance, their work, their hospitality, various aspects of their life as a child of God. Imitate them so long as they are following Christ. And then number six, commend the elders for good things they do. Second Corinthians chapter 12 verse 11 is not a specific reference to elders here. It is uh, has to do with... Uh, with Paul in, in this particular context, and yet he talks about the matter of, of being commended. He should have been commended of those brethren. But the question is, are we as quick to commend as we are to condemn? If we see something going awry with one of the elders, we're really quick to point it out. But if we see something good that they do, it's like, well, that's what you'd expect out of an elder. No, that, you know, that's... To me, that's kind of the idea of, of our announcements. And I've, I've stressed this before, and I've, I've noticed we different ones do it here. But when we welcome our audiences on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we welcome our visitors. Oh, we're glad to have you here. What about the rest of you? I'm glad you're here. You know? It's not like, and I, I've heard this said. We're excited. We're glad the visitors here. Members, you're expected to be here. Well, you are. But you know, it'd be nice to commend them once in a while and say, we're glad you're here too, and we are. And I don't just say that for point of emphasis here. I feel that way. I'm glad you're here. Those who assemble together on a regular basis are a tremendous encouragement to me. I appreciate that. We try to let you know that from time to time. So commend them. James 5.14, call for the elders when in need. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Any sick, let him call for the elders. doesn't say let him call for the preacher. You folks need to heed that verse. <laughs> Love that verse. Now, I don't mind you call me, but the Bible does teach. Now, of course, in this particular context, I'm convinced that there is a miraculous element involved in view of the context and time which is written. But nevertheless, who is it that's watching for your soul? Who is it that should know your life better than anybody else in the congregation? Your elders. Why do you not want to call them, have them pray for you? They're the ones that are watching for your soul. And elders ought not to mind that responsibility when placed in that situation. But you'll notice what does James say? Who's to do the calling? The sick. The sick. It's not the responsibility of the elders to check the hospital every day to see who's entered or not. Somebody go to the hospital, stay overnight. Next thing you know, they're railing accusations. Well, I was in the hospital the other day. Nobody came out to see me. Anybody know you were there? Did you call anybody? What does James say? By inspiration. If you're sick, call for the elders. Tell the elders that you're sick. Let them know what's going on in your life. Why? They care for you. We all care for you, but they care for you. Uh, yeah, they're not mind readers at all. So then, somewhat of a conclusion to all of this, congregation must function as a unit. 
each member working to the good of the other in various passages. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, talk about the, the body concept, how the body works together. And so we, we have to respect the instruction of the Holy Spirit in this regard relative to our responsibility to those men who are over us. And if we fail in that regard, if we rebel against the leadership, we're rebelling against God. What was it God said whenever the people of Israel wanted a king and God's man felt like he had been rejected? God said, they've not rejected you. They've rejected me. Whenever we reject God's leadership, we've rejected God. Folks, that is serious business to get into that category. All right, well, that pretty well covers the most of things in that. Like I said, we'll, we'll have a couple of lessons now on the, uh, the uh, importance of public worship and the object of worship, and then that's where we'll have to leave off. But then we'll come back, actually, lessons 23 through 32 deal with the matter of worship. So uh, once we come back to this study, whenever we come back to this study, then we'll pick up with that section on, on worship.
have your attention for some announcements before Brother Sidney offers the invitation this evening. One to mention on our 